Warning, in light of recent events involving mass shootings in America, the subject matter and details contained in this video may be triggering to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. It was Friday and eight-year-old Melanie Chadwick could practically taste the weekend. As she dressed for school that ordinary spring day, sleeping in, along with the end of the school year and the anticipation of summer vacation were practically all she could think about. She could never have imagined how unordinary a day it would become, or how dramatically her innocent, peaceful life would be altered when a pair of gun-wielding assailants breached the safety of her classroom. It was May 16, 1986, in Cokeville, Wyoming. The tiny town was home to approximately 500 residents, and about 140 of them were children who attended the Cokeville Elementary School. It was the only elementary school in the rural community, which was located in Lincoln County near the Wyoming-Idaho border. On this particular May afternoon, the school was filled with 136 students and 18 adults. At 1 o'clock, David Young, a former Cokeville town marshal who had been fired from his job, arrived at the school parking lot. With the help of his wife Doris, age 47, and his adult daughter Princess from a previous marriage, 43-year-old Young unloaded a crude, gasoline-filled bomb from the back of a van. The trio loaded the bomb-like device, along with an arsenal of four rifles and nine handguns, into a grocery cart and headed for the school building. Cut to Cokeville, Wyoming, 1979. A graduate of Shadron State College in Nebraska, David Young earned a degree in criminal justice and moved to Wyoming. For six months in 1979, Young served as the town marshal and was the only police officer in Cokeville. At the end of his probationary period, however, he was terminated from his position. Young met his second wife, Doris Waters, at a bar where she worked as a waitress and sometimes singer. Soon after tying the knot, the pair left Wyoming and moved to Tucson, Arizona. According to Doris's daughter, Bernie Peterson, David became a virtual shut-in spending his days reading and writing what would later become his philosophy tome, Zero Equals Infinity. He became increasingly reclusive, while Doris worked part-time jobs cleaning and waitressing to support their small household. The newlyweds shared a mobile home with David's daughter Princess, aka Penny. She was the younger of his two children. He was estranged from his older daughter. While not a religious man, Young wrestled with deep thoughts about spirituality and the afterlife. He kept a journal detailing his beliefs about what he referred to as a brave new world. He wanted to, quote, reign over intelligent children. As the years since his firing from his martial post dragged on, resentment and anger festered in Young. He and Doris became believers in the white supremacist movement and were members of the Aryan nation. Along the way, Young concocted a scheme to get rich quick, designed to help facilitate his brave new world. He recruited his longtime friends, Gerald Deppy and Doyle Mendenhall, to join him in his plot. The friends went all in, at first. Young was passionate and persuasive, but he kept the details of his big plan to himself. He had researched school districts and decided Cokeville Elementary kids were the perfect chattel. He didn't tell Deppy and Mendenhall that he planned to take over the school and demand $2 million apiece as ransom for the students. He wrote, Threaten one, and all are at your mercy. The second part of the plan involved detonating his homemade bomb and blasting all of them, along with the money, to kingdom come, where he would become their god. It was 1 p.m. when David Young and his accomplices pulled into the parking lot at Cokeville Elementary. He now disclosed the details of his sinister plot, which was falling apart faster than slow roasted pork. No longer part of the plan were daughter Princess or accomplices Deppy and Mendenhall. All had panicked and bailed when the details of the big plan were revealed to them. David would not be deterred. He ordered Doris and Princess to handcuff the unwilling accomplices inside the van. Then the trio breached the security of the school. Once inside the building, Princess changed her mind and raced back to the van. She then drove the vehicle, containing the handcuffed Mendenhall and Deppy, to City Hall to report the hostage siege. He was alone in the hallway. The bomb, situated inside a grocery cart along with his arsenal of weapons, was attached with a string to his wrist. Then he entered the school office, distributing copies of his manifesto and shouting, This is a revolution. Meantime, Doris traveled room to room, 
wrangling the students and teachers into a first grade classroom under the ruse of gathering for a school assembly. The kids ranged in age from 5 to 12 years old. Also lured to the room were several administrative staff, a UPS driver, and a job applicant. 154 people in all were taken hostage in a classroom made to accommodate 30 students and one teacher. A short time later, cramped inside the small classroom, the students were becoming restless and scared. They didn't understand what was happening, only that the cart in the middle of the room was no toy. It was stuffy and hot, and a tiny pinhole in the gas container allowed gasoline to drip and fumes to build. The adults watched in horror as David Young, in the center of the room, slipped the piece of twine over his wrist. This string was attached to a wooden piece that was part of the bomb, and along with the dead man switch would act as the detonator. The other components of the explosive device included a gallon jug of gasoline, blasting caps, gunpowder, tuna fish cans, an aluminum flour mixture, and boxes of ammo designed to explode into shrapnel. As the day crawled on, the room was stifling, and many of the children were felled by the gas fumes. A few of the adults reported feeling nauseous as well, and they eventually convinced Young to permit them to open several windows. They were unknowingly creating ventilation for the impending explosion. By this time, police and parents had arrived on the scene. Also standing by were members of a SWAT team, plus several fire trucks and ambulances. EMT Glenna Walker anxiously waited for orders. This was her first call as a paramedic, and she initially thought it was a mock drill. She had three children of her own inside the school. David Young demanded $2 million per hostage, which amounted to just over $300 million. By today's calculations, adjusted for inflation, that amount would be approximately $720 million. He also wanted an audience with President Ronald Reagan, to whom he had mailed a copy of his manifesto. Tensions were mounting both inside and outside the school, as armed parents threatened to go in and overtake the bombers themselves. Police tried to maintain order while they wrestled with how to handle this situation, for which they were completely unprepared. Inside the classroom, teachers had assembled toys and games to distract the kids from the harrowing situation at hand. One of the children had a birthday that day, and the group, including the hostage takers, joined in singing the birthday song. The calm didn't last. They were kids after all, many of them little kids, and they were hot, scared, miserable, and impatient. At one point, a young girl accidentally jostled Young, who was still attached to the bomb. Already irritable and very nervous after two and a half hours of the standoff, he lost his temper and ordered Doris to oversee the situation. He slipped the twine over her wrist, and with the sounds of children praying in his ears, he exited to the adjoining restroom. Second grade teacher Carol Peterson recounted David Young's mounting agitation and nervousness. He was covered in sweat, and she recalled, I was frightened and felt that we needed to do something to try to calm down or to be careful because he was so agitated. Two of the teachers talked him into letting them create a magic square with masking tape, an eight-foot square area in the middle of the room for the homemade bomb. The students were instructed to stay outside the square. Peterson explained that the kids sat staring at Young inside the magic square with the bomb, and that made him very nervous. He threatened to shoot anyone who tried to escape. Now, with the bomb attached to her wrist, Doris Young was losing her cool, both figuratively and literally. The children resumed whining and fussing, and she had had enough. When her suggestion that they try to pretend they were in an adventure movie didn't help, she, in her delusional mindset, noted that they would have quite a story to tell their grandchildren. The adults tensed as she became more and more annoyed and anxious, carelessly flailing her hands about. Suddenly, as she swiped at a trail of sweat dripping from her forehead, Doris Young accidentally tripped the dead man's switch and blew herself up. She became part of the fireball that filled the room as panicked, screaming students and adults raced to the windows and door to escape. Outside, hysterical parents and other rescuers broke out the windows and pulled children to safety. One after another, they were pulled from the building, many suffering injuries or burns, most crying. Ten-year-old Amy Bagasso panicked as she felt flames crawl up her back. She remembered learning to stop, drop, and roll. While she lay on the floor in the black, smoky room, though, frantic students walked over her, and she feared she would die. 
She was rescued by two of the male teachers who pulled her from the fire and carried her to safety. When the smoke cleared, investigators filled with dread entered the classroom searching for victims, but within the hour, all 154 people, both children and adults, were confirmed to have escaped the fire zone. Doris Young had perished, but not from the explosion. It was later discovered that David Young had shot his burning wife in the head. Next, he took aim at music teacher John Miller as he tried to flee. He shot Miller in the back, then he exited the room and shot himself with his 45 caliber pistol. The wounded teacher survived. Both perpetrators were dead. Doris's charred body was also pulled from the building and lay lifeless in the grass. Shockingly, the only casualties of the explosion were David and Doris Young. As for the Young's failed accomplices, Princess, Deppie, and Mendenhall were released without being charged. Authorities concluded they were not insiders to the details of Young's plan, and their refusal to participate spared them culpability. In all, 79 children were taken to hospitals for smoke inhalation or burns. Many sustained severe burns that would require months of healing and painful surgeries. Billy Joe Hutchinson, who was eight years old on that fateful day, was forced to wear a compression body stocking to cover her burns and later underwent corrective plastic surgery. Long after the ordeal, she noted that the smell of gasoline still unnerves her. The emotional healing for those impacted by the bombing took time, but ultimately, all 136 children who had obediently remained outside the Magic Square survived, along with the teachers, staff, and visitors. But how was this possible? Were they just lucky to have escaped the evil perpetrated by a deranged madman? Some of it looked like luck. When the bomb exploded, the children who had previously been within inches of the device were at that point a short distance away, outside the magic square. In addition, when the windows were open, the ventilation allowed much of the bomb's force to escape. And finally, a blasting cap was determined to have been faulty. It failed to fully detonate. According to explosives expert Richard Haskell, it could have and should have destroyed that entire end of the school building had it functioned properly. But ask many of the survivors and they will tell you luck had nothing to do with it. To them, their escape can only be attributed to divine intervention, or what most would call a miracle. Survivors recounted silently praying throughout the ordeal, then later praying together in a prayer circle. Just before the blast, a number of hostages saw a bright, illuminated presence hovering above them. Many described seeing angels, and several children said that an angel had directed them to move toward the windows, which they are certain saved their lives. In fact, the outline of what appears to many to be an angel was singed into the wall after the blast. In 2005, the Copeville Miracle Foundation published a book titled Witness to Miracles, Remembering the Cokeville Elementary School Bombing. Survivor Cameron Wixom was interviewed for the publication and states, A childlike faith saved us. I did not have to imagine how God would move. That day when I said my little prayer, I simply knew he would. He did deliver our salvation that day. I am living proof.